Previously, on Solve the World. Captain. I don't get it. I think the agent should affect the whale's chemical makeup. Meaning, she'll pass on her size to her newborns. First mate. Thus, introducing a subspecies to the ocean. Yes. Precisely. It'd be a rare glimpse for humanity to witness what a completely foreign new species does to the environment. Being a differing size, they'll have new predators that their ancestors didn't have. But yet, they'll not require the same energy intake or food consumption. They'd have to come up with their own new survival tactic. Solve the World. A fictional adventure told in 100 episodes. No matter what race, era, culture, no matter nothing, people fall into currents of popularity. Episode 63, New Scars. Jennifer, hello. Jen looked up from her reclining beach chair, sunglasses on, her feet sunk deep into the Tongan sand. She said nothing. Jennifer Dash, do what the Spartan is asking of you. Isa, Jen said, subtly smirking. I've never heard you say my name before. Come on, it's the most spoken name in the world. Besides maybe Lilith Babbitt. Isa, the former smugly impersonator, sighed. It's been four days. I need to get back to Christchurch. Please. Then go. It's not that easy. There's not exactly a commercial airport I can book a flight on. This isn't my fault, Jen argued. I'm not saying it is. Jen's response was almost wholly non-emotive. Esau wasn't getting anywhere. What do I need to say to get you going? No response, Jen said, coyly referring back to the first conversation the two shared. Jennifer... I want to bury my brother. We have parents, you know. Back on New Zealand, they don't know what's happened. They need to know their son is dead. Jen removed her sunglasses and squinted deep into Esau's eyes. Everywhere I go, people are either trying to kill me or trying to use me. Jen motioned toward the tide and the beautiful scenario all around. Here, for whatever reason, these people aren't forcing my hand. They want something out of me, just like everybody else, sure. But, at least for now, they're not manipulating me or torturing me. I can just stick my feet in the sand, enjoy the beach, and forget about my worries. Maybe you could too. Esau couldn't help but notice how beautiful Jen looked. The SETI folks had given Jen an orange bikini, and she was wearing every inch of it today. But... Nevertheless, this was about as far as Esau could bear to humble himself. Well, okay then. He walked away having spoken his piece. Jen watched him tarry off into the distance. She'd heard many times over that identical twins feel it when the other is hurt. She wondered whether Esau felt it when Marianne stabbed Jacob to death, felt his neck open up. She wondered whether he felt the hot sting of death gush from his main artery. Wondered if, even now, he felt death's presence through his brother. What could that possibly feel like? The SETI folks had hooked Jen up with a fully furnished seaside cabin. Well, 
not quite seaside. The cabin was built on the banks of a small but fast-moving tributary that flowed into the sea. It was, say, a ten-minute walk following the little stream to get to the beach that Jen so enjoyed spending time on. Jennifer Dash wasn't by nature a beach bum, but hey, every morning brought with it a choice. As she followed the stream down, she had the option to hang a right just past the beach she liked. This beach was particularly picturesque because of its horseshoe shape. The island jutted out a ways on either side, making the view impeachable and the tides even gentler than normal to wade in. Jen rarely tipped even her toes into the water, but it was nice having an easy access point. Just past the beach was a fancy outlook building, a modern-looking triangle structure that Joanna de Tocqueville, Joe for short, but also more colloquially known on the island as the Spartan, spent her work days. The Spartan told Jen that whenever she was ready, she could come to the building between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., and Joe would be there, ready to show her what the SETI operation was all about. On several mornings, Jen had planned on at least hearing the lady out, but every time, she just couldn't bring herself to pass up that beach. That darn beach. One could persuasively argue that SETI was making it too easy on Jennifer. Not only was her cabin air-conditioned and refrigerator full, but someone came in the cabin every day while Jen tanned her body on the beach and made up the bed for her. It would seem that Jen could live out her whole life on this island without a care in the world. Even the closet was jammed with clothes especially brought in for Jen, most of which looked pretty good on her. From time to time, Jen would see Tongans rummaging about the island, going about their business. But thank the good lord, none of them seemed to take notice of Jennifer. Maybe they didn't have any TVs on this island. That was the one thing missing in Jen's cabin. No TV. To amuse herself after a week on the island, Jen started reading a book. She'd swiped it from the one little library on the tanker before coming to shore. She was curious what Esau saw in it. 20,000 leagues under the sea. The travels of Captain Nemo and company were riveting. Jen found herself gobbling up the book. That is, until the part with the giant squid. She knew it was dumb, knew that it was just a story, but she couldn't read past that scene. Too scary. She read the book three times over, always stopping at that part, always leaving the book unfinished. It just got under her skin. This giant squid, it was, was like Leviathan. For some reason, Jen couldn't bear to think of Leviathan as anything but wonderful. She wanted so badly for Leviathan not just to exist, but to be somehow friendly, kind, and intelligent. She was nearing the squid-induced pages once again one afternoon, reading on her stomach, laying out on her reclining chair under the heat of the sun when Esau came once again, marching up to her. For some reason, Jen was embarrassed. She didn't want Esau knowing that she was reading his book. So, as his shadow casted down on her, she dropped the book in the sand and buried it with her hands. It seems unlikely that Esau didn't see this, but if he had, he made no mention of it. Can I sit next to you? Sure. Jen said politely. Esau had carried his own folding chair. He unlatched it, smushed it into the sand, and sat reposed beside Jen's laying body. Unlike Jen, who was once again bikini-clad, Esau was wearing blue jeans and a white button-down shirt. He unbuttoned the shirt, letting it flap in the wind, perhaps to give Jen a good clear view of his pectorals. But Jen remained face down, so the sight went unnoticed by the teenage girl. Ten minutes later, Esau spoke up apparently giving voice to what he really came here for. It should have been me. Huh? Jen responded. It should have been me that died. And Jacob that lived. 
Oh, why? Jen said dumbly. For Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Huh? What? Jen clearly didn't get the biblical reference. Jacob's always been the better one. He was better at everything. He kept me in line. I should have been the one who died. No. Jen said, not really knowing what to say. Her only memory of Jacob was that he wore that tuxedo and that Marianne killed him. Jen's no didn't get any sort of reply, so she felt the need to fill the awkward air with something else. I lost my friend too. Marianne, she was my bodyguard. I feel bad for not choosing her, you know, to come on the helicopter. I saw Jacob just before the plane hit. Did you do it? No. Okay. Isa got up, began folding his chair up, shaking off the sand. You can't ignore the world forever. You need to talk to the Spartan. I will, when I'm ready, Jen said honestly. <sighs> then get ready. Once out of sight, Jen hurriedly fetched a book out from under the sand as if it was holding its breath the whole time. Jen knew that the encounter with Esau was the boy's way of begging. He was, in his own smug way, get it? Smugly? Smug? Pleading, begging Jen to get him back to New Zealand. Something inside her urged Jen on too, told her that the least she could do would be to at least hear the Spartan out, see if what they wanted from her was something she could give. Yet, despite these internal and external urgings, every morning the siren song of the beach was just too strong. Three weeks floated by in a suntan daze. That is, for Jen they floated by. For Scout further, those three weeks were the most anxiety-ridden of her life. Thus far. Scout learned quickly that bulking your number up at Onmo was no easy task. Scout had started with a yellow 13. In order to not be entered into Saturday's banishment lottery, she needed to rise her number above seven other people. She needed a green number. Scout further was not going to be sent on a train out of Onmo. Her father, brother, and even Betty had equipped little Scout with an iron will. She knew what had to be done. There was no way around it. She'd been given a low number. She'd work harder than any other inmate at Onmo. She'd rise through the ranks. If this system was really built to be a meritocracy, then Scout further would become queen by means of her work ethic. She learned quickly that most jobs offered a one-to-one -one correlation. Bike an hour on the stationary bike, receive one point. That would be okay, but there were also plenty of ways to lose points. Eating a meal cost anywhere from one point up to four, depending on the variety of malandrinian you asked for. Sleeping in a bed rather than on the ground also cost you a nightly point. Using a bathroom cost a point. It seemed that the system was built to keep kids mostly in line with the number they were given. Going from 13 to 200 looked to be darn near impossible, but Scout was gonna find a way. There were lots of tricks to learn. Initially, Scout decided that until she was in the green, she'd forego all meals. But, to her great surprise, powdered malandrinian, a food substitute that was made to be mixed in with a glass of water, was easily stealable. Sure, it cost one point to take from the keg of powder, but there was no regulation on how much you could take at one time. The device only let you take one scoop per point, but that scoop could be as big as you could possibly manage. Scout learned that she could cup her hands and get approximately 10 spoonfuls of powder in one swipe. That was efficient eating. Next, as already mentioned, most jobs only doled out one point per hour. But not all jobs. Some were deemed more unsavory than others. Sanitary waste disposal, for example, gave out four points per hour. This was Scout's ticket out of the danger zone. Every morning, she'd go in and notch four to six hours funneling children's poop out of Anmo. It was horribly stinky work. 
Scout often found herself overwhelmed with nausea, but it had to be done. The only real bummer about the work was that it absolutely made necessary a long shower at the end of the day. Showers cost one point per 10 minutes. With the pitiful water pressure at the Onmo showers, 10 minutes didn't even begin to cut it. Scout would have considered cutting her long hair short just to make showers easier, but something as bourgeoisie as a haircut cost upwards of 10 points. Too rich for her blood. So, on most days, Scout resigned herself to 30 minute showers. That's minus three points a day. Nearly an hour's work knocked off just for a stupid daily shower. In the evening, Scout would burden herself with dishes. This served two purposes. For one, dish work was an extra point per hour. Scout got two hours in a night, usually. And for two, she got to use soap on her hands to wash the dishes with. Showers didn't come with soap or shampoo, so doing the dishes was an effective way of at least getting some of Scout's body soapy clean. If she had opportunity, she'd often smother her face in the soap when no one was looking. At night, finally, Scout slept in the fetal position on the floor. She was so tired by day's end that the hard ground really didn't bother her. That's what the ancients did anyway, right? Her father, Joseph, often liked to tell Scout about the ancients and how they lived. And now, look at her. Scout was living life just like her ancestors. By that first Saturday, the first judgment time, Scout sat heroically with 123 points. Of course, that's 80 off from the 200 that some lucky kids got to start the week off with. But nonetheless, 123 landed Scout firmly within the green zone. She would not be carted away today. There was some controversy in her company that day, however. As it turned out, the kid with the lowest number, Scout heard he actually had zero points by Saturday, was chosen by the blue-colored kid to be exonerated. That meant that one of the yellows, a kid chosen at random, got trained out of Anmo. The blue kid was a child that was given the number 198 to start the week, and then apparently just worked a little on stationary bikes all week to make it to the highest ranking 216 by week's end. He was good pals with the Zero Kid, and so, together apparently, they'd figured out in advance how to save each other. Then came the blow. Scout was happy up until that point. 123 was respectable. A couple more weeks working at her pace and she'd surely be in the top 10. Maybe even the elusive number one kid, the blue numbered kid. Scout had the drive. Most of the others were content with just being above yellow. Scout was on a mission. That is, until late Sunday morning. Hundreds of new recruits packed into Anmo. There was enough new blood to fill in the 1% banished the day prior, as well as plenty more to create a new 200-kid company. Scout realized the purpose of the number system. Anmo couldn't fit all the kids coming in week after week, so Constable came up with a way to manage the population. Perhaps an adult would rail judgment at the Anmo leadership for this barbaric tactic. But Scout didn't think like that. She accepted the system for what it was. That is, until Sunday afternoon when all devices reset. Set. Your number, as it turned out, didn't roll over week to week. Scout's 123 was gone. Poof. Just like that. In its place, unlucky number 13 blared up once again at Scout. Yellow. Scout's morale dropped like a rock. What was the point in working hard all night and day if your work didn't matter? What was the point if you didn't get to see the fruit of your labor? Due to mild depression more than anything else, week two saw a very different scout and a very different number. She stopped working in the sanitation department. She ate gray, somewhat tasty malandrinian three times a day instead of the powdered mall once daily. By Thursday afternoon, scout's number was 33, still very much in the yellow. Anxiety raked her little mind that night. She got up from her snugly bed around 11 p.m. and worked one of the stationary bikes until her muscles spasmed and she could hardly breathe. 
By Friday night, her number stood at 47, still in the yellow. She couldn't sleep that night. She tossed back and forth on the hard ground, too weak to get up and do more biking or other chores, too sore and scared to fall asleep. Eventually, though, exhaustion gave in. She woke up to the throbbing sounds of judgment. Scout looked down at her number, still 47. But somehow, in the night, she'd gone from yellow to green. <sighs> Safe. It wouldn't be until Friday of week three that Scout would learn why that was. Having gone through the hair-pulling anxiety of being on yellow almost all week, Scout was once more driven to reach green status early in week three. She went back to the waste depot. It was no fun, but it was the fastest way to ascend. She decided she'd quit it as soon as she got into green status. It didn't take long. She was sporting a nice 42 by Tuesday evening, snugly in green territory. The rest of the week went swimmingly, nearly stress-free. That is, until Friday night. Scout fell asleep in her bed. The one-point cost of a comfy bed, Scout figured, wouldn't sour her green at this point. She awoke to watch a bunch of hoodlums strutting away from her den area. The hoodlums were known by their gang leader's name. Killjoy. Killjoy's Friday night fun time included walking around throughout Onmo corridors and smashing as many children's numbers as possible. If you lost or broke your number, you had to report to the adults what happened and receive a new device. The device would be set on the number one. Scout awoke that night to find her device smashed in. Killjoy had killed Scout's Joy. As fast as she could, she ran to the Dolt station, got herself a new device, and stared wide-eyed at her brand spanking new Red One. She somersaulted over to the sanitation department, hoping beyond hope that she could launch her number up by four every hour through the night. No dice. The sanitation department only operated during the day, so it was back to the bikes. Scout pedaled and pedaled. By 8 a.m., her number was seven out of the red zone, but still very much in the yellow. Her name... would not be called on Saturday's lottery. She was safe once more. Scout lived to work another week. But this brush with evisceration was a bad omen of things to come for the youngest living member of the Further family. One morning, two and a half weeks into her stay on Tonga, Jen found her cozy little beach flooded by locals. Not just locals. Two humpback whales had beached themselves on Jen's cove. One of the two mammals was quite small, the other absolutely enormous. There were folks all about the beasts, like ants pushing, pulling, dumping water over their tongue-like bodies. Jen figured by the looks of it, it was a mommy and daughter shipwrecked together. The big one, what was it, 70 feet long? Simply enormous. It's because of the bombs, Joanna de Tocqueville said, sneaking up behind Jen as she stood jaw dropped at the tremendous scene. How do you mean? Jen responded. Humpbacks migrate through these parts, usually only through September. World War III hasn't just destroyed the lands of the earth. It's also ravaged the ecosystem of the sea. Everything, and I mean everything, is off. Jen looked up at the elderly stateswoman. Why do they call you the Spartan? Joe smiled. Do you know who the Spartans were? Greeks, right? Good fighters? Yes. Exceptional fighters. Their entire culture was built around their fighting men. To be Spartan was to be a warrior. So, you know martial arts or something? Joe's smile turned into a pleasant laugh. <laughs> no, no. I run SETI like the Spartans ran their military. That is, with one goal. Everything I do, day and night, serves one purpose. What's that? That's what I've been waiting to show you. Come, there's much for you to learn. Wait, Jen said anxiously. What's gonna happen to the whales? 
It's not looking good. Getting baby free should be easy enough, but without Mama by her side, she doesn't have much of a chance. Why not? Is she still nursing or something? Joe the Spartan pointed at the big whale. Do you see these long scars across the length of her body? Jen did see the scars. She noticed them from the get-go. They almost looked like deep-set wrinkles, except they were dark red, blistery. Jen had initially surmised that the big mama humpback must have run aground of a big sane fishing net or something of that ilk. They looked to Jen to be unnatural scars, wounds that only man could give a monster. Yeah, where did they come from? Joe sighed. Like I said, the ecosystem is out of whack. These are new scars. This humpback fought off a giant squid. Jen's eyes just about bulged out of their sockets. Really? For some reason, in just the last few months, every whale that's passed on by has worn similar scars. The bombs have awoken the sea monsters of old. Whoa, whoa, what do you mean? The, the, the giant squid was hibernating and now the nukes have awoken it? The Spartan stared at Jen, wondering how dumb she really was. No. I was just using a turn of phrase. As I was saying, the ecosystem has been knocked off its balance. Normally, giant squid and other similar monsters stay deep in the sea. They don't come above a thousand feet below the surface. But now, they're confused, bouncing up closer and closer to the surface. Jen rushed to the great whale. She stood next to it, dwarfed by its girth. Jen had to feel it for herself, had to know what the sting of Leviathan felt like. She touched the whale's skin, outlined her deep scars with her fingertips. Joanna de Tocqueville stood by Jen, observing the young starlet. Jennifer Dash turned towards the Spartan. Show me your operation. Hey guys, this is Dante, creator of Solve the World. This week's episode has an allusion to another fictional work. When Jen reads 20,000 Legs Under the Sea and always stops at the point when the giant squids attack, that is a direct allusion to Michael Crichton, author of Jurassic Park, his novel Sphere, which was also made into a half-decent movie, also called Sphere, starring Dustin Hoffman, Sharon Stone, and Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, check it out if you haven't. It's a great read. Um, doesn't have a lot to do with Solve the World, but since I'm borrowing that idea, I thought it only fair to inform you that this episode has some references to that. Hey, this week, check out our Facebook page. Listener Frazier has donated his time and effort to draw us a new Leviathan starring cover photo. It's super awesome, looks great, and I continue to be awestruck by the art, the blogs, the reviews... All the stuff that listeners are doing to boost Solve the World's presence on the internet. I really appreciate it. Another listener also created a subreddit page. Check that out too. And uh, if you were unaware for some reason, if you do any sort of art for Solve the World or write a blog, write a review, analyze the characters, anything like that that enlarges Solve the World's footprint online, I will gladly put you into the Solve the World Society where you can listen to new episodes a week in advance and get some other goodies as well. Thanks, guys. And, by the way, tip jar. I always take tips. And uh, see you next week.